Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the global Indian business meet by Horaces is well underway in Antwerp. Uh, we had a very uh, lively session in the morning, very stimulating thoughts came about. Uh, we are going to discuss a few more issues today on this smaller panel about the India growth story. Uh, we heard a lot of things. We want to talk today, what is the role of the banking sector and liquidity of, in the growth of India story? Uh, I'll introduce my panel to my right is Mr. Enka Singh, Member of Parliament and a very uh, well-known economist of India who's looked at economy from the macro perspective and will take his views on what that's all about. Then we have Suryal Kaushal from the Stand Chart ECO of India. Uh, we will talk to him about the banking sector in India and how it impacts the India growth. And of course, Jayant, the Trade Commissioner of Belgium and Flanders in Bangalore. And we'd like to look at his perspective as to how he sees uh, this thing growing to that. So my first question is, uh, we heard a lot about the growth story uh, in India and some hiccups and all. What is the role of the banking sector in doing that? Is liquidity the issue on which the growth is getting hiccup up or is that not true? And I think we we'll start with you first of all, uh, Sunil, because you're from the bank to tell us, is that the issue? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, liquidity, we have a structural liquidity issue, but I won't say that's the only issue. And banks uh, in India have played a large role uh, both in the growth of the Indian economy as well as uh, in the internationalization of India. If you see some of the large acquisitions that have been made um, and the globalization of the Indian corporates, I think banks have played a role. I think the issue is far more complex than simply liquidity. Uh, Mr. Mr. Inke Singh, your comments on the macro look on the liquidity part of it as a part of a growth driver or a, you know impediment. Well, I think that I'll have uh, 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 three comments to make. First, I entirely agree that it's not only a question of liquidity, but it's a question of the cost of liquidity and the manner in which risk is assessed. The second issue is that the banking sector reforms in India, which had been initiated quite a bit, has been achieved. But I think there's a long way to go in terms of a number of legislations on the banking sector which remain stalled, uh, which would enable, for instance, I think that to give an example, the, the fact that you have a cap of 10% in terms of the uh, uh, voting rights which foreign banks can have. I mean, no sensible bank would like to put in more money if it's not reflected in terms of voting rights. There are a number of other stalled banking legislation. And the third, and, and most importantly, is the availability of credit uh, for the agricultural sector, which I think is very crucial in terms of uh, being able to materialize what the finance minister has said, what the prime minister has said, the second green revolution, particularly in eastern India, we really require the support of the spread of, of, of affordable finance for agriculture, agriculture-related activities, small and medium industries. The large industries in India, fortunately, are not suffering from lack of liquidity, uh, although right now the cost of borrowing is high, and this can, of course, tie me green fields investment, that of course depends on the perspective of the central bank in terms of anchoring inflationary expectations, and I don't think inflationary expectations have been anchored for loosening credit policy. So I entirely agree that the reform of India's banking sector goes well beyond the limited concerns of, li of short-term liquidity availability. Jent, you agree to the comments made by them, and you feel that's your experience in Bangalore when you talk to your various friends there? Uh, yes, I think uh, where I get involved is uh, in the cross-border acquisitions or cross-border investments of companies. I think the banks do play a major role in there as well, in their advisory capacity. So they do a lot of uh, syndication of, uh, uh, of the funds, uh, financing aspects, and also ma majorly in the advisory roles in M&A, uh, largely in the mergers and acquisitions. I think the Indian banks, both the MNC banks and also the uh, okay. local banks are playing a major role in India's growth as well there. I mean, I think that's, right. that's one of the points which I would like In fact, to take you out from your point there, uh, yesterday we were having a discussion along with Frank with uh, one of the companies gone for a big acquisition in Belgium. I think they you know, the calling you know, Juneja or Benani Group. And one of the major issues that he put across in his views was that he was very uh, difficult for him to do the m and based on the banking support because the kind of... Uh, banking collateral and the kind of uh, regulatory procedure that are required for m and abroad for funding by an Indian bank, he felt very, very uh, crippled by it. It took a long time for him to do that. 
And he said he doesn't have a level playing field because of that, because other people are doing that. So as far as MNA is concerned, do you think in Indian banking there is still a need for us to look at it differently in part of collateral, personal, private? So that's something which was worrying him quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, I obviously can't comment on a specific case because I don't know the details. But uh, having heard whatever you said, and you know, absolutely must be true. But uh, if you look at some of the largest acquisitions that have been made in the recent past, actually have been made by Indian corporates, given their ambition to globalize. Uh, and there have been instances that we discussed, whether it is Bharti acquiring Zain or whether it's Tata's going acquiring, uh, you know, Jaguar, Land Rover, so on and so forth. There are issues. There are issues in terms of the structure that is acceptable by the uh, regulators uh, in terms of funding. I think the deeper problem or the larger problem is actually the depth of the capital markets. Because if you look at the Western world, some of these acquisitions actually can be funded through the capital markets yes. and not reliant solely on banking uh, or the bank finance. So I think to that extent, uh, it is it is uh, slightly more challenging for Indian corporate wanting to go beyond borders. The other point I would ask, you know, add here, slightly digressing from this one, is what Mr. Singh mentioned about financing. I think financing for banks uh, and for the economy is absolutely important in terms of financing the SMEs. Hmm. And if you look at the G20 and B20 discussion that recently concluded, that's an area of focus besides financial inclusiveness. So I think SME financing has to be at the core of every bank in India. Okay. Uh, taking from that, uh, Mr. Nika Singh, uh, the uh, rural banking or the micro banking, micro lending uh, seems to have a lot of glamour uh, as far as the press is concerned, but when you go down to the grassroots, does it seem to be taking that kind of drive that is there? Could you give us some prospective solutions to really make it the way effective that it should be that's made to look out to be? Well, I think that uh, banks need to look to innovative instruments in terms of uh, satisfying risk aversion, uh, in terms of ensuring compliance to uh, lending procedures. And I think that those kinds of innovative solutions, which are somewhat out of the box, which needs to be region-specific, uh, which needs to be industry-specific, is critical for the banking sector to make a deeper penetration into India's rural economy and India's household economy. I entirely agree that the depth of the capital market uh, needs to be really significantly improved. But how do you go about it? One, of course, are regulatory and other changes on which I think that the SEBI is doing a credible job. But I think beyond that, uh, if India currently, the savings rate in India has unfortunately come down from 31% in 2007-8 to just 26%, we need to get down to 35 to 38% to be able to get to 9.5% rate of growth. And apart from foreign savings, you must really deepen and enlarge the depth of India's capital market, which means accessing savings in India. And all this necessitates the banks adopting a somewhat more innovative approach in terms of diversifying and increasing the depth of their presence in areas and markets in India and regions which largely remain untapped. Okay, thank you very much. Jet, tell me, uh, you have from Flanders region and seen the trade reforms and the banking and the financial systems in Europe. How do they compare when you go to India and be the Trade Commissioner in uh, Bangalore? Are the regulatory procedures to set up businesses in that part of the world still stringent, still difficult, still red tape is there? Are the ABE rules st stronger as opposed to the Flanders region? Well, I think uh, one of the challenges that uh, the uh, companies coming in from uh, Flanders to India will see is the documentation, which are the regulations of the uh, uh, land. So. I think it's more to do with the knowledge that these companies do have to be provided on various documentation that needs to be provided. Okay, if there is a specific document to be provided or a legalization or a notarization of a specific, because these are all the uh, RBI regulations which have to be met with. So I think this is where we play a role in trying to convince or to educate the investors on trying to comply with this uh, documentation. Um, they are increasingly becoming more and more simplistic now. I think a uh, lot of uh, simplifications have happened in the RBI as well. So I think the companies would be in a position to uh, take the advisory roles of uh, various um, uh, companies and then the, the banks. Thanks. And the banks do play a major role and then I think they have divisions where they do support the companies. Yeah, yeah they do. Now, Sri, tell me one thing that uh, we see that lots of these uh, foreign banks in India uh, have their, uh, you know, portfolios more towards the bigger 
companies, and you talked about SMEs, like you said, has Tanchat got any uh, plans to expand to the rural area, rural finance, and in that area, the risk aversion that uh, Mr. Singh talked about? Do we are prepared to take that and go into those difficult paths and be seen in Tri Three City, uh, proper bank functioning in that manner, which is the aspiration of a lot of Indians? No, I think it's it's a very very important point in terms of. Uh, the, let me start with the SME business. Uh, yeah. You know, since you mentioned Standard Chartered, uh, we are the largest lender uh, to SMEs amongst international banks. Okay. And we run a portfolio which we believe is quite diverse, quite innovative. But that's not enough. We have a we have uh, a limitation in terms of just the branch presence and the physical network that is there. Uh, I think you touched upon microfinance. Microfinance, unfortunately, also got embroiled in some yeah. controversy with you know some states changing regulations, so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that doesn't help. The uncertainty doesn't help, and that industry has taken uh, quite a quite a beating because of uh, the uncertainty that was created. Our view is, given the current regulations, every uh, you know bank should play to its strengths, mm -hmm. and some of the foreign banks, uh, you know ours included, have strengths in certain sectors. And um, I would I would even venture to say that you know, uh, in terms of focus. Uh, like we've got a focus on agri, we've got a focus on small and medium enterprises. We should also, in the priority sector, widen the net and bring in maybe some of the infrastructure, health, uh, education in, so that we are able to play the role, given our limited inf you know, franchise and footprint, in those sectors okay. and play it effectively. It's not about including more, it's about what you do with what you have. So okay. we are in certain cities, we are in certain tier two, tier three towns as well as the branch licensing uh, you know, liberalizes, we can play a good role uh, and an effective role in, in those areas as well. So, yeah. Mr. Singh, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you feel, as a macroeconomist who's done so much of Indian economy, has India's growth story as a resilience to handle a 60 rupees uh, dollar uh, coming to the end of the year they were talked about? Or is it the fears of misplaced and we can handle this uh, exchange rate and we can handle this economic flow and will be stabilized over a period of time? No, I think that the India growth story, uh, which currently seems to be, uh, have hit a somewhat bad patch, is I'm sure very transient and transitional, because the fundamental drivers of India's growth comes from India's <coughs> inherent strength of its own uh, uh, endogenous, unsatiated consumption, its, its demographic dividend, uh, the fact that the liberal liberalization which has already taken place uh, is significant. The fact that notwithstanding weaknesses of central government, many regions in the country are exhibiting very rapid rates of growth like uh, Bihar has been mentioned, <coughs> Gujarat and so on and so forth. So I think that the India growth story is, in my view, uh, uh, which, has, which seems to have attracted somewhat adverse notice of foreign investors, is a transitional and a very transient phase. We will get back to the higher growth rates as soon as some important macro corrections have been taken, particularly the areas of fiscal deficit. The current account deficit has already begun to moderate because uh, pr international prices of crude has come down, uh, the fact that uh, gold uh, imports are likely to come down, the fact that imports have also begun to slow in, and exports are bound to kick in. Now this significant question of whether we can handle uh, rupee at 60, the more important question really is that we need to craft policies which will minimize volatility okay. in currency movements. It is the volatility and rapid movements which is debilitating, which industries uh, and corporates and individuals cannot plan for. And that the Reserve Bank of India and the central government will initiate and has initiated measures to minimize the volatility. And since today, if you have seen, uh, Moody's has kept India's uh, credit, uh, India's rating, overall rating, as stable, stable and not downgraded, the India growth story will come back because it's being driven by the macro fundamentals of the economy, some of which will get repaired. It is being driven by domestic consumption, not excessively reliant, even though the fact remains that India today is globally far more interdependent than it was, say, 10 years ago, uh, when we were handling the balance payments crisis and I was in the Ministry of Finance in 91, 92, uh, working with Dr. Manmohan Singh, Trade as a percentage of GDP in India was just 14 percent. It's 44 percent today. We are a far more integrated economy than, than, than we ever were. So I think that the global <coughs> factors have also really cast a deep shadow, and India cannot pretend to now remain insulated with uh, with global factors. But there are 
inherent domestic strengths would to some extent mitigate the impact of growing global uncertainty, particularly the manner in which the Eurozone crisis will get resolved. Oh, very sorry. Uh, thank you. Last question now. Uh, this story about the prospective legislation. You have been in the government at the various higher circle right up to the finance ministry. Uh, would you share Karan Birimoria's perspective that's been very bad? And you also, Sunil, tell us this prospective legislation a la Vodafone. Can it be done? Can it, yeah, oh, yeah. Retrospective. retrospective. Sorry, retrospective. Can it be undone or should it be undone? Or it's past yeah. water under the bridge? You want to ask me that? Yes. You're being a part of the government, so you tell me. Well, you me. know, I have been a former revenue secretary yes. of India uh, for several years. It's my personal opinion that the issue is not whether government and parliament has the legal right to enact retrospectively or not. Sure, it has the legal right, but I think that all taxation measures must be viewed on the ultimate fulcrum and judge of the reasonableness of conduct. Oh, right. And I think that this was really a, a kind of a change which was avoidable. It has lent uncertainty in the minds of investors, and I think we need to put these uncertainties to rest by undoing and of reapplying these measures in a manner which would meet international benchmarks and which would allay investor fears. Thank you. And you agree with that, uh, Sunil? I completely, completely agree with that because it has created a great deal of confusion uh, and in many ways anger in the minds of the foreign investors. So I totally agree with Mr. Singh's comments. Uh, but, but it looks a bit surprising uh, given the people who are at the helm of affairs are the same people who are talking about liberalization and seem to be very wise and they've gone and done it and the whole public opinion feels... So it's not only, uh, it's, uh, pardon my interruption, is not only retrospective uh, taxation on which I have already commented, but I think that is the whole constellation of change in the regulatory framework yes. contained in the DAR, in the uh, principles of general anti tax avoidance measures. Now, I think India, of course, doesn't want to be a tax haven. Uh, India has a legitimate right to certainly ex extract its bit of taxes, but I think it must do it in a manner in which it meets the best international benchmarks and is globally acceptable. And I think the manner in which the guard was sought to be applied right. will make really all investment planning suddenly change a regime. I think we need a better transition. Ajit, I'd like to ask you a question. The trade between India and Belgium has been growing, especially in the region. Can you just tell us what kind of trade is coming in, what kind of companies are investing in India, what kind of companies are investing from India into Flanders, and what is the relationship building up and where it is going? Yeah, I think uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, we, there is a renewed focus on BRIC countries from the Flanders uh, region. Okay. So India is one of those uh, countries where we are now looking at more and more Flemish companies are coming and investing. Uh, across India. And then also what is heartening to see is more and more Indian companies also looking at uh, the Flanders region to invest, uh, to address the uh, customers in Europe. So for instance, the advanced manufacturing sector, uh, they want to be nearer to the customers. So we have looking at warehousing capability in Flanders, mm -hmm. uh, which we are uh, very centrally located in Europe. So I think all of these uh, pointing out, so we are heartening to see that more and more Indian companies are now looking at uh, investing in Europe and more specifically we have laid a uh, number of those examples being invested in Flanders. Are there, are there any sector specifics which I meant about or they are just across about all across are going on there is sector specific areas which are taking place? Um. Of course there are companies which have uh, invested in uh, across the sectors but okay. then I think if you really put together in some bundling of segments I think one three segments which we can think of. One is advanced manufacturing. Okay. The other one is logistics. Okay. The other one is pharmaceuticals. So okay. These are some of the three sectors where more and more companies are coming in. Of course, it doesn't rule out the other sectors coming okay. in. That we have facilitated other sectors coming in. So these are some of the critical mass of companies where they're coming in. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Thank you.